Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us back. We are excitedly waiting to see the things you are going to teach us. We know that your word is a blessing in our lives. It edifies us. It strengthens us. It builds us up. And Lord, we want to be built up. We have come humbly seeking your Holy Spirit who will teach us your truth this evening. And so please, Lord, feel free to move in our midst, move in our hearts, lead us in your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, the almost forgotten war. A war of words that many today have no idea that there is a war between truth and error. Many are living in ignorance, but we're going to notice that not everyone. Some testify, some know the truth. Even if they don't follow it, some declare that they know the truth of the Sabbath. And we'll get there. But I want to start first by making uh, uh, it very clear to you that there are many times in the Bible when God changes his mind, when he changes the things he has established, when he changes the things that he has said. But I want you to notice as we conversate about these stories, there's a theme to it, and that theme is really important. Let's start by going all the way back to the beginning again. Genesis chapter 2, we find a command of God about how to live their lives in the garden. Let's notice this. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... You shall not eat it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Do you notice here in this command, it is a mixture of a command and a promise that if you don't follow the command, what will take place, right? The command is simple. Don't eat of that tree. Don't touch that tree. But then added to the command is a promise, the word that says, if you eat of it, that day you shall surely die. So there's the law. And then there's the result of breaking the law. Well, we know the story. We've talked about it. Adam and Eve ate of that tree. Did they die that day? No. Notice the law does not change, but the result of breaking the law is given a condition. What happened immediately? What told them that they had sinned? They were instantly, they instantly realized they were naked, right? They were naked. And so what do they do? They try out salvation by works, which the Bible says is the spirit of Antichrist. They try to cover themselves in fig leaves. Does it work? No, because when God comes down, they hide. Why? What do they say? We hid because we were naked. Salvation by works didn't work in the beginning. It doesn't work today. It doesn't work. And so by the end of that chapter, by the end of that story, they are given a different condition, a different result. I want you to notice what God does in the end uh, of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Do you think that there was an animal now walking around the Garden of Eden without any skin? What happened to this animal or animals that clothed them? These animals died. This became the first offering of blood as a symbol of the promise that they did not die that day because something else, an animal, died in their place. A reminder now or a promise, hey... Jesus is going to come and die in your place. Did the law change? No. Did the result of breaking the law change? Yes. It was, it was a conditional according to salvation. Last week we talked about the story of a golden calf. Israel is brought out of Egypt. 
They, are, they see all kinds of miracles. They see a crossing of the Red Sea. They see who God is. They're, they're learning who God is. And then Moses goes on the mountain, and suddenly they come up with this idea, we know, let's build a golden calf that we can worship and claim is our God. When God sees us, I want you to notice what he says to Moses up on the mountain. Exodus 32, verse 10. Now, therefore, leave me alone or let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you, Moses, a great nation. So when he first sees what they're doing, he declares, I'm going to consume these people and we're going to start over with you, Moses. You're going to make me a great nation. But Moses, like the animal that died in the garden, becomes a symbol of our mediator. Because Moses stands on the mountain between God, Jesus, and the people below. And so he becomes a symbol of the great mediator that we have in, he in heaven. Notice just a few verses later what Moses says to God. Verse 13. Remember Abraham. Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. You know, Moses isn't being bossy with God. He's relying on the promises of God's word. That's exactly what we should do today, right? That's exactly the call today, is to rely on the promises of God's word. He doesn't say, who do you think you are? How dare you? He says, hey, remember your word, your promises, your prophecies. You've promised this nation to enter into the promised land. So what does God do? Very next verse, verse 14. So the Lord relented from the harm which he, had, which he said he would do to his people. Does he change the law about worshiping other gods? No, but he changes the outcome for the sinner because they're called to salvation. Moses would come down the mountain and would say, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. There was an invitation to repent and to confess. God does not change the law when we sin. He, change, he gives us a condition that if we want to change the outcome or the results of sin, we have an invitation to him called salvation. Do you know this story? I know you know this story. Jonah and, we call it Jonah and the whale. It's really Jonah and the great fish. Whether it was a whale or whatever it was, we don't know, but it was a great fish. Jonah is told by God, go to Nineveh, who, by the way, if you don't know, Nineveh is the enemies of God. They're terrible. That's the Assyrian Empire. And he's told, go to Nineveh and tell them, I'm going to destroy the city. And Jonah's like, I don't want to go there. Those are scumbags. Those are Gentiles. I don't like those guys. Not only does he not obey God, but he goes the opposite way as far as he could. He gets on a boat sailing for Spain. Get me out of here. I want to go to the far side of the world, which he believes is the other side of the world. I'm going the opposite way. Well, of course, you know, a storm comes. He says, guys, it's me. Throw me in. God is just mad at me because I'm disobeying. He gets thrown in. This great fish swallows him up, brings him back to the land and vomits him up. And God says this now to Jonah. Jonah chapter 3, verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So the message Jonah takes into the city of Nineveh who does the message come from? God. This is God's own words that he's going to speak. What, are, what is the message? Two verses later. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What is the message of God that Jonah is repeating? This place is going to burn in 40 days. Do you notice a condition here? 
Does it state a maybe, a might be? Does it state you need to repent? Is there any message of repentance? None. Judgment is, go- is here. You are done. 40 days, you are dead. But we know what happens. The people, having a time of probation, go to God in repentance. They mourn over their sins. They get rid of their gods. They get rid of the things that are sinful. And they repent of their sins. Did God burn the place down 40 days later? No. Notice chapter 3, verse 10. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Do you see the condition in all these judgments from God is salvation? If we come to Jesus and we repent and we confess, there's a change in the judgment. There's a change in the outcome. He never changes the law that they're supposed to follow. He changes the outcome of breaking the law. In fact, there's even verses in the New Testament that prove this. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But, so you said death all sad. I know why, because we've all sinned, right? But the what? Oh, you said gift the same way. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So the wages of sin is death. That bums us out because we've all sinned, right? We've all sinned. I mean, who here wants to share their sin journal and share with us? Pass the mic around? We've all done it. Let's just leave it at that. How's that? We know we've sinned. We accept that we're all sinners. We've all made mistakes, but there's a condition to it. And it's the condition of salvation. The wages of sin might be death, but Jesus now offers us the gift of eternal life. Acts talks about this. This is Peter. That was Paul in Romans. Let's see what Peter says. Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, And be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance, we talked about, is the heartfelt expression. Confession is the mouth expression, or even in our mind. It's the the verbal expression of our sins, but repentance is the heart confession. Lord, I'm feeling terrible. I know and I accept that I need help. Humble me and help me overcome sin. Help me rule over sin. And Peter says, if you repent and if you're converted, there are two really cool Greek words in the New Testament that mean conversion. The first word is apistrofo, apistrofo, and that means a U-turn. If you're heading in the path of sin, you're walking into the wages of sin, which is death, you're following Satan, he encourages us to what? You turn away from it. Do a 180. Don't keep following after sin. Don't keep going over there. Don't say, okay, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, as you continue to walk towards sin. He's telling us, repent and be converted. Do a 180. Live a new life. The other word for conversion, and you'll know this word, it sounds familiar to a word I know you've heard. The Greek word is metamorpho. Sound familiar? Metamorphosis. When a caterpillar goes through a metamorphosis, it goes in to the cocoon as a caterpillar. Does it come out as a caterpillar with wings? It's a whole different kind of animal now, an insect, right? It's now a butterfly or a moth, a whole different kind. Because we go into the waters of baptism, our old self, we die to our old self, and then we come out walking in the newness of life. A, an epistropho, a, a metamorpho has taken place. We are a new creature in Christ, Amen. It's great news that in Jesus Christ, I don't continue in my sins. I turn away from them and I follow the Lord. The result is that our sins may be blotted out. Our sins are written down. We'll talk more about that this, uh, over the next few days as well. The sins being written down in the books of heaven. 
They're called books of remembrance. But your sins can be blotted out through the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And at times of refreshing, a newness of life, a, a whole new experience of, of God. We talked about the rest that he has for us will come from the presence of the Lord. The law doesn't need to change to do this. The law remains the same, but the condition changes because salvation is granted through grace by faith. Do you know that there are two things that you have a choice of getting blotted out. Every human being has this choice. One of the two will be blotted out. We've learned here that we have the option of having sin blotted out of our record books. What's the other option that we have? Notice what Revelation says. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. John writes this, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, meaning purity. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. We have two options. Every human being will have something blotted out in the books of heaven. We can repent and be converted and have our sins blotted out, or if not, then our name will be blotted out of the book of life. That's the ultimate gatekeeper when it comes to who's going to heaven, who's going to be taken off of this earth and go into the pearly gates of heaven when Jesus returns to take us home. It'll be names written in the book of life. And I pray at, that every single one of us chooses to have our sins blotted out and to keep our names written in the book. Amen. I hope that's your choice and your desire as well. So our sins are blotted out if we accept salvation. You know, there was a point when Jesus, when the Godhead decided, you know, these people are going to sin. They're going to sin. We're going to have to figure something out. Someone's going to have to make a decision. And Isaiah tells us about this counsel. Notice what it says. Isaiah 59 and verse 15. Speaking about with the wicked, so truth fails. That means with the wicked it fails. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Now notice. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. God evaluated, he investigated, he judged sin, and he realized it's terrible for us. He knew already, of course, but in this investigation, they came to the conclusion they're going to sin. This disple Isn't that good to know? That it displeased God to know that there was a path where we might not live eternally with him? That the God of the universe wants to live eternally with you? Is that good news for you tonight? Beautiful news. It displeased him at the idea of sin. And he saw what? There was no justice. There's no way around it. Sin is sin. Sin causes death. Sin causes eternal separation from God. There's no justice. There's no hope. They had to come up with a plan. Very next verse. Here's the plan. He saw that there was no man. In other words, no one could help us. And wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. God saw the problem. Sin is terrible. It causes death. It causes separation from the Lord. Horrible, disgusting thing, this sin problem. He saw there was no justice and no hope unless, there was no intercessor, unless he himself signed up for it. And what did Jesus say? I will go. This is why the Bible declares he was the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. They knew when they created us what would happen. And Jesus said, I will go by my own arm. I will bring salvation for the people. Amen? The conditions changed. The law did not change. The conditions of breaking the law Change. Think about some of these stories. We've got Genesis chapter 2, as we already mentioned. You know, when they ate of the fruit, 
if God's law could be changed, he would have changed it here. He would have come down and said, why are you guys hiding? Well, we're naked. Why are you, why are you, why are you naked? Because we ate. Oh, well, no problem. I'll just change the law. I'll just say, okay, you can't eat of that tree. You're all good. But could the law change? No. And so he had to offer salvation for those who broke the law. When it came to the worship of the golden calf, he could have told Moses, hey, I know I just gave you the Ten Commandments and they're not supposed to worship other gods, but you know what? It's okay. They're, they're, they have a good heart. They, they think it's me and that calf. I'll just change my law and let them. But is that what he said? No, but he provided a path of salvation for breaking the law. Same thing with Nineveh. He, he told them, you're all going to die in 40 days, but he offered salvation to that generation. So the question that we're studying and discussing tonight is, did God change his law, or rather, did he provide salvation from breaking the law? Well, I think we know the answer. He provided salvation from us because we are ones who break the law. God's law did not ever and cannot ever be changed. But there are Equally to this, there are many stories in the Bible where people tried to change God's law and God's commands. In fact, a story we've already covered several times now, Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. Notice that Cain tries to change God's law. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Why did God respect Abel? Because Abel was following his law. God had said, An someone has to die. Something has to die. An animal dies in the sin offering. Blood must be shed as a symbol that Jesus Christ would come and shed his blood. But what did Cain do? He tried to change God's law, didn't he? He said, no, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my way. God respected Abel. Well, let's read the next verse. What, how does he feel about Abel? But God, he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. There are people today who are saying God's law has changed. God has not authored that. God has not changed his law. And when you tell people from the Bible, listen, the Bible says his law doesn't change. They get just as angry as Cain. They get upset. No, no, it has changed. My church is right. My pastor's right. My family's right. You can't tell me that there's all these Sunday keepers in the world and they're all disobeying the word of God. Well, yes, according to the Bible, they are. Many in ignorance, and so I won't judge them, but many in ignorance, but they have tried to change God's law. But God does not allow us to change his law to suit ourselves. You know what that is? That's righteousness by works. But it's not how we're saved. It's not how we find obedience. We don't follow our own law or our church law or our pastor's law. We follow God's law and God's word. It's righteousness by faith. That Jesus knows better than us. We will trust in him and him alone. There's another story. Fast forward a thousand plus years here. Almost two thousand years. The story of a prophet named Balaam. And Balaam is offered by the Moabites. The Balak, the king of the Moabites. If you come and curse the people of Israel. I will give you great riches and power in my kingdom. Well Balaam, though he's a prophet... He's tempted by this offer. And so he goes to the Lord. He says, Lord, and I'm paraphrasing. This is the, the new King, uh, no, new Pastor Phil version. Please, Lord, please, 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 please. I really want these riches. I want this position. Please let me go with them. Let me curse the people of God, your own people. Now notice what God tells him to respond to his pleading. Numbers 22, verse 12. And God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Is God pretty clear here? Is this a command from the Lord, a directive from the Lord? You cannot go with them. They are blessed. 
So the servants of Balak go back to Balak. They say, sorry, Balaam's out. No, 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 no one turns down the king. You tell them that we will double the rewards. We'll give him even more riches and even more power. He can have everything except for my own authority. He can have everything else in my kingdom. They come back and they offer this to Balaam. Balaam goes back to God. Please let me go. Can you imagine how blessed my life would be? Please let me have this opportunity. But notice what God says just a few verses later on the second time of pleading. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. Let's pause there for a moment. Does God now give a condition? And the condition is simple. What is it? If they come to you again, if they come back to wake you up in the morning, if they come knocking on your door, then that is my approval that you can go with them. Here's the problem. They don't come knocking. When he's asking, they've already left. They've already gone. Let's go back to the verse. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. What is he doing? He's trying to change God's word. He goes still speaking on God's behalf. He still goes proclaiming as a prophet of the Lord. I'm still going to do the Lord's work. And he's acting as if God has changed his mind. But God doesn't change his law. His law is perfect in every single way. Throughout the Bible, we have people living their lives as if God changed they're his words, that they have the authority to change God's words. Look at prophecy. We read this yesterday. Look at prophecy telling us about this Antichrist power. Daniel 7, 25, he shall speak pompous, that means blasphemous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend, that means thank, and shall thank to change times and law. Then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time and times, a half a time. We noticed last night that only one of the Ten Commandments specifically deals with time. And this power thinks it has the authority to change times and law. Specifically, it thinks it can change the Sabbath. But can we change God's law? Absolutely not. So powers who say they have that authority, the Bible has already declared they don't have the authority. They just think they have the authority. So when it comes to worship, when it comes to Sabbath, the Bible has declared that in the last days there will be people who keep his commandments holy and there will be those who think they keep his commandments holy. But they're following the traditions of man. Why can't God's law be changed? Really, I shouldn't say why it can't be. It's really why it shouldn't be. Because of what it is, it shouldn't be changed. Notice Psalms 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony or the word of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The law of the Lord is perfect. So if you change it, it, can it become perfect if it's perfect? Any change to it would create it to be not perfect. It's already perfect. That's why God refuses to change his law. Throughout history, throughout our history, the create, creative being's history, God always creates things perfect. Lucifer in heaven, is that, is that proven already from Scripture that he was created perfect in every single way? And who decided to change Lucifer? Did God change Lucifer? Lucifer changed Lucifer, right? He changed his own character. How about Adam and Eve? Were they created perfect in every single way? And who decided to change their perfection? They decided to change it, right? They followed in rebellion. Are we, are we still perfect? No. Satan changed God's perfection. He's not perfect. Adam and Eve changed God's perfection, and they're not perfect. We're not perfect. How about our planet? Was it created perfect in every single way? And we changed that by sin. Is our world still perfect? 
No, it's fallen apart on us. Every time we see people change what God has established as perfect, it falls apart and it, it just devolves in front of us. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's absolutely perfect in every single way. And it converts the soul. I hope you understand that this is why Satan wants us to believe that the law was done away with. Does Satan want souls converted? And so if he has people believing the law is not important, the law is not doing its job because people aren't looking at the law. Now, how does the law convert the soul? Well, James says that the law is like a mirror that we look into. When we look into the mirror of the Ten Commandments, we see the reflection either of Christ's righteousness in us or our sinful pride in us. We look at the law and we may see and go, oh, I'm, I've broken that one and that one and that one. I need help, Lord. And so the law points out our need for a Savior. It points out sin. You see, the law points out two things. The law points out the righteousness of Christ, but it also points out the sinfulness of man. Right? Understand? It points out both. It is a written transcript of the righteousness of Christ, but it also points out our sin and our need of a Savior. Have you ever had one of those mornings? I have these every morning. I wake up and I see how sleep has messed up my hair. You ever have that problem? You wake up in the morning and you see your hair is pushed to one side. You've got bags under your eyes, junk in your eyes. You've got pillow prints on your face, right? You wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you go, wow, I really got messed up last night. Some nights it looks like you got in a fight while you slept, right? So when you look in the mirror and you see your need of help, do you rub your hair and your face on the mirror? No, that's silly. That's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Why? Because the mirror's job, its responsibility isn't to change you. It's to show you what needs to be changed. The Ten Commandments do the same thing. The Ten Commandments cannot save you. The Ten Commandments cannot change you. The Ten Commandments simply show you what needs to be changed. And then what do we do? We look in the morning, we look in the mirror, we see our problems, and then we go to the water to fix it. We take a shower, we wash our face, we go to the water to fix it. We look at the law... And we see our dysfunction, and then we go to the water, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, to cleanse us. You know, I see the big difference. We are not saved by law, but the law has a mighty important job to show us that we need a Savior. And this is why Satan does not like the Ten Commandments. Why he wants the world to believe they were done away with. We read in, Dave, in David's writings, we read in Psalms that the law is perfect. How about the New Testament? Paul writes this. Romans 7, verse 12. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. This is after the death of Jesus, after the resurrection of Jesus, after the ascension of Jesus. Does Paul say, therefore, the law was a good thing? Past tense. No, even in his day, by the inspiring of the Holy Spirit, Paul's pen writes that the law is holy and just and good. It still has its job for us today. It still points out the righteousness of Christ that I want, that we need, but it also points out our dysfunction and our sin. So that's David in the Old Testament. That's Paul in the New Testament. How about Jesus himself? Did Jesus say anything about changing the law? Well, yeah. Notice what he says, though. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to Fulfill. We'll talk about that word fulfill in a moment. But first of all, I want you to notice how clear and concise this is. 
It really does confuse me. It baffles me that so many Christians today say when Jesus came to this earth, he abolished the Ten Commandments. He did away with the Ten Commandments when he clearly says, I did not come to destroy them. I didn't come to change the law or the, or, or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy what I've already built, but to fulfill these things. Now, I want you to know that the Bible is clear that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. But does that mean that they were done away with? Well, think about who literally was nailed to the cross. Was Jesus nailed to the cross? And is he done away with? Is he abolished? Is he changed? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what does it mean when it says that it was nailed to the cross? Well, Jesus is the righteousness of God on this earth. He was the one showing us the righteousness of God. Jesus was nailed to the cross, and the Ten Commandments reflect his character to us. And Jesus died as both the perfect Son of God... And he carried our sins to the cross. The dual nature of the law, it demonstrates the righteousness of Christ and it demonstrates our sinfulness. And that's what was nailed to the cross. But that doesn't mean it was done away with just as it doesn't mean Jesus was done away with. In fact, <laughs> Jesus is resurrected, amen? Still in the grave? No, he's resurrected, but he didn't come out in his normal human form. He came out glorified from the cross. He came out as king of kings and lord of lords. And equally so, the law is glorified after the cross. Why? Because now we have a path and an example in Jesus Christ of how to keep the law. So the Ten Commandments were glorified, not done away with. They were made more sure and more important because Christ has come to show us how to rule over sin. Amen? Makes sense. Okay, now he said, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What does that mean? Well, let's notice what fulfilling the law meant. Paul would give us the clue. Romans 13, verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Remember that, please, if you have pesky neighbors that you can't stand. Christians, we love our neighbors. It doesn't say only if they deserve it, only if they're nice, only if they keep their weeds on their lawn or their dog on their lawn. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, he says, love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus came, we've read this before, to demonstrate the love of God for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Very clear. He came to demonstrate love, to show us love. Was love done away with at the cross? No. Therefore, law was not done away with at the cross. Because the law is a written transcript of how to love. The first four commandments teach us how to love God. The last six teach us how to love our neighbor. Pretty clear and concise. God still wants us to love him, right? Yeah, so the first four still are included in our life. Does he want us to still love our neighbor? Absolutely. Therefore, the last six are still important for us as well. God has brought the law before us. He has made it a part of our lives so that we can walk in the righteousness of Christ. You know, Christ and the church are married, right? The Bible uses the symbolism repeatedly through Scripture that Christ and the church are married. There is a special bond between the Christian and, and Christ himself. Well, notice, we talked about this last night a bit, but notice what Jesus himself says about marriage. Mark chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. These are quoted at wedding ceremonies around the world. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Marriage is a symbol of salvation. Did you know? 
When we become, when we are saved, we become married to Christ. And the two become one flesh. Does Christ ever want us to separate from him? To divorce him? To play the harlot? Absolutely not. He wants us to be saved in him. He wants to be our groom as we are his bride. The law also then becomes a part of our life. We are stitched together to it because we are called to follow the righteousness of Christ. The law still matters to the Christian today. So let's spend the last few minutes then looking at that historical context. Why have people, we've already cleared, this is clear and concise. Now God did not change his law. So what happened when people changed his law? Well, we got to go back in history to the first official change. This is the official change in the church when the church announced we are no longer going to keep the Sabbath, we are going to keep Sunday. This took place in 364 and it's written down as canon number 29. But before we read it, I want you to notice the council's name. The Council of Laodicea. Now if you don't know prophecy, Laodicea, Laodicea plays an important role in Bible prophecy. Laodicea was a city in the time of, uh, of John where ice-cold water would come off of the mountains and settle down in the city. But also in Laodicea, hot spring water would come up out of the ground. And so the people could not drink the water in Laodicea. Why? Because it was a mixture of hot and cold. It was lukewarm. It was tepid. I know some people that even on a hot summer's day, they will drink hot tea or hot water. And I'm the guy who will drink ice cold water on a cold day. But I don't know a whole lot of people who say, give me the lukewarm water. Laodicea is a symbol. It is a, it is a symbol of what happens when the church mixes truth and error. The hot, the heat of God, right? The glory of God, the righteousness of God, the character of God, and the darkness of sin. And it's important to note that this official change from Sabbath to Sunday took place at the Council of Laodicea, where people were going to mix truth with error. You think that's providence there? Absolutely. He was trying to prove to them, listen guys, this ain't a good idea. You are mixing the world and my righteousness. But notice here, this is actually the canon. Here's what it says. Christians shall not Judaize, in other words, don't be like a Jew, and be idle on Saturday, but shall work that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. You see, this is not my opinion or the opinion of this church, but historically, people did not like the Jewish people because they claimed that they killed the Savior. Did the Jewish people kill Jesus? Who killed Jesus? Our sins, right? Our sins. He died in three and a half hours because our sins melted his, his heart like wax. The Jewish people didn't kill Jesus. Our sins are what killed Jesus. The separation from the Father is what killed him. But they looked down upon the Jewish people and said, they killed our Savior. We want nothing to be like, we don't want to be anything like them. And so they said, well, they keep Sabbath. We better not be like them. And I want you to know, you know I've been accused before, several times in fact, of when I teach the Sabbath that I'm teaching salvation by works. Have you heard a very opposite message than that? Have I been clear that we are not saved by works? This is not in order to be saved. This is because we are saved in Jesus Christ. Amen? But every time I preach about the Sabbath, someone always says, you are someone who is teaching salvation by works. But that's not true. But notice, did you catch that this is salvation by works? If you are like a Jew, if you keep the Sabbath, we will shut you out from Christ. If you don't keep our day, if you don't keep Sunday, you are not saved in Jesus Christ. The history of the change is because they took away salvation by grace through faith in the church and they adopted salvation by works. And when it was salvation by works, they said, you will do what we say and not what God says. 
That's the change. It was built on racism. Don't be like that race of people. We're going to separate ourselves from them in every possible way. Did we learn last night that the Sabbath is the anti-racism message that the world needs and it brings people together as one people of God? It was racism that made the change. I want you to notice what Monsignor Louis Segur wrote in his book, Plain Talk About the Protestantism of Today. He writes this, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is homage. That means means the, the, the worship, the veneration they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of who? The church. You know, when Protestants had the Reformation, when we had the, when we were formed and we separated ourselves from the old church, there was a really important doctrine. There were several doctrines, but a really important one called Sola Scriptura, which meant we get our doctrine from the Bible alone. Our doctrines that we believe come solely from the Bible and the Bible only. Catholicism said the opposite. Well, we don't get it from the Bible alone. We get it from the Bible. We get it from church fathers. We get it from the popes. That's where we get our doctrine. And so the Protestants said, no, only from the Bible. Well, Louis Seguer saying, well, if you only get it from the Bible, you shouldn't be keeping Sunday. Because the observance of Sunday is, is honor you give to us and our authority that we have historically to change the day. Those are his words, not mine, but let's notice what John Cardinal Gibbons writes. This is a a publication called The Catholic Mirror. He wrote this in 1893. He says, reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday... Or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. And then I've underlined his last sentence for you because it's really important. What does it say? Compromise is impossible. So he's saying, this is why I call this the almost forgotten war. Many people today have no idea why they go to church on Sunday. But when we look historically, we see that this side clearly tells us why people go to church on Sunday. Listen, you're giving, you're giving our authority glory. You're doing it because we have done it. We made the change. And he says, reason and sense says it's either one way or the other. Either sola scriptura and Sabbath is Saturday or authority of the church and Sunday is, is the Sabbath. It's one way or the other. You cannot have both. This isn't even the gospel of Pastor Phil. This is their own writing saying, listen, you've got to choose one way or the other. Let's notice the next one. The other, another publication called Our Sunday Visitor from 1950. It says this. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. Notice, there's no Bible verse there, right? It doesn't say be based on the apostles, based on Jesus, based on the word. It says because the church made the change. Let's keep reading. But the Protestant mind doesn't seem to realize that in observing Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. See, right there, they're calling Protestants ignorant, and that is True, because a whole lot of people don't realize that they're on the wrong day for public, intimate worship of God. They have no idea. But the church knows, and the church glories in this. The church says, yeah, you guys are doing it, and you don't even realize you are accepting our authority of our spokesman, the the Pope. You're doing it because the Pope told you to, and you don't even know. The church glories in this idea. Now, when someone is an adult and they convert to Catholicism, when they are any other denomination, Protestant denomination, or a non-Christian, and they become a Catholic, many of them receive a book called 
the Convert's Catechism. Now, the Catechism, I own one. It's a big, thick book and has all the rules and laws of the church. A Convert's Catechism is kind of an abbreviated one. Just the main doctrines of the church and why they believe it. I want you to notice what the Convert's Catechism says about the change. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Clear and concise? They agree. Saturday is the Sabbath. So that would beg the question, what? Well, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity, that means the holiness, from Saturday to Sunday. Do you catch it? Again, straight out of their own mouth, from their own pen. Why the change? Because we did it. We did it. That's what they say. Questions aren't done. Because the next question should be, well, who gave you that authority, right? Notice that's the very next question. Question, by what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday? Answer, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plentitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. The church says we have divine power to change God's law. Have you heard this lie before? We've heard it through the stories, but did God ever change his law? Jesus himself said, I did not come to destroy the law. I did not. In fact, the very next verse says, I won't even change the, the, par uh, the, uh, the, the paragraphs uh, or the, uh, <laughs> the grammar of it, the periods and the apostrophes I won't even change. The jots and the tittles, he says. But the church says, nope, he gave us the authority to change his law all we want. But is that biblical? It's not biblical. See, people ask me, I get this question a lot. Does it even matter what day? Well, you tell me this or their words. Does it seem like it matters to you? Seems like it matters to me because if I'm keeping Sunday holy, I am honoring the person in the church. If I keep Sabbath holy, I'm honoring Jesus Christ himself. You tell me, is that important? For those on YouTube, they said yes. They just said it very quietly. Let's notice what priest Brady says. 1903. By the way, we don't even have to go scouring through sermons to find this. This was publicized in the newspaper. This was reported in the Elizabeth, New Jersey News in 1903. He said this in a, in a homily, in a sermon. It is well to remind the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Methodists, and all other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in the observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. He doesn't mix his words. He's just straight out there in this sermon saying, hey, listen, guys, the Bible doesn't support it. Is he speaking truth? Absolutely. Is he mixing the error in there? The commandment of the Catholic Church, the Council of Laodicea is still alive today. The mixing of truth and error. This one might be the most appalling. Catholic Records said this in 1923. Notice this. Deny the authority of the church, and you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday in the fourth commandment of God. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. That's from their own pen. If you keep Sunday holy as the Sabbath day, I didn't say if, if, you, if you, you know, study your Bible or if you pray or if you worship the Lord. If you keep it as the Sabbath, you are proving that the church is above the Bible. You're proving that man can change the words of God. 
That's appalling. That's an abomination. That's a sin to speak that way. And now we notice what the pompous, the blossomous words were of this power. That they are above the word of God. Okay, so all of those quotes so far are Catholic quotes. What about Protestants? One of the most important uh, documents that we have on this topic is a sermon spoken by Dr. E.T. Hiscox. He was speaking at a Baptist minister's convention. I know this is a long time ago, in 1893, but it's still true today. I want you to notice what he says in this sermon at this convention. By the way, if you don't know, Hiscox is, is an authority in terms of doctrine. Now, that doesn't mean that he, he created doctrine, but when it came to Baptist doctrine, this guy knew everything, all the ins and outs of all the Baptist doctrine. He has written their Baptist manual and their doctrinal books. He's a big name in 1893, and he says this about the change. Of course, I quite well know that Sunday did come into use in early Christian history as a religious day as we learn from the Christian fathers and other sources. Okay, so he's accepting that it goes back to the days of early Christianity. Did we notice that too? Council of, Ni of, of Laodicea in 364, okay? But notice what he says next. But what a pity that it comes branded with the mark of paganism. And christened with the name of the sun god. Then adopted and sanctified by who? By the papal apostasy. And then bequeathed or given as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. I don't know this man, obviously, dead long before I was ever even thought of being born. I believe this man loved the Lord based on many of his writings that I've researched. But I wish that this had been a shining light in his face to get him to realize what he was doing. He openly admits to a group of Baptist ministers that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was sanctified, was made holy. But he doesn't just say by the Pope or by the church. He admits it was sanctified by papal apostasy, by papal darkness, by papal false authority, by sin in the church. It was made, how does something unholy make something holy? How does something in darkness change the light of God? He's admitting it that it was papal apostasy that made the change. And I, oh, how I wish they had all stopped and thought, wait a minute, what are we doing? But you know what? We can't go back and change that meeting, but we can change what we do today. We can learn from it. If I don't know, maybe someone did walk out and say, what are we doing? But we can say, no, Lord. We're not going to let apostasy in the church decide our decisions. We're not going to follow the ways of this world, the ways of darkness. We are going to follow the light of Jesus Christ. We're going to follow the truth. And we're going to keep your Sabbath day holy because it's a delight in our lives. Two last verses and we'll close. Simple conversation to close. The Bible is very clear that the final test at the end of time is about authority and worship. That a power rises in this world who says, I have the authority of God on earth and you will worship the way I tell you. Notice this. We'll read two verses in Revelation 13. By the way, if you don't know the Bible, this is the 666 chapter. This is the mark of the beast chapter. And it all deals with authority of man to enforce worship. Two quick verses. So... They, that's the world, worship the dragon who gave what? Authority to the beast. That's the Antichrist. And they, the world, worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Who's the dragon? Satan. 
He gives his authority on this planet to the Antichrist. And what does the Antichrist do? You will worship me. By the way, if you don't know, Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ. It means substitute Christ. In place of Christ. This power will come in the world and say, I am God on earth. You will worship me. I have the authority to tell you to do so. Notice verse 8 to close. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb. Slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, there's an exception to this rule. Everyone in the world will follow the authority of this Antichrist, this in place of Christ. Everyone in the world will worship this false God except those whose names are written in the book. Those who will say, absolutely not. I worship God and God alone. And his word tells me when and how to worship him publicly. That's our choice Family, follow the leader or follow the other leader. Only one path leads home. You follow Christ, you keep his Sabbath. It's a delight and a blessing in your life. Choose to follow Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for making this absolutely clear to us. It's been preserved in the Bible preserved in Christian history, we know exactly what is truth and what is error. We see the sides that are being defined. We see that, that there is two options, true sound doctrine or false doctrine, the wine of Babylon. Lord, I ask for courage now. Some of us have a choice to make. All of us have a choice to make, but some of us have a new choice to make. A choice to follow your holy word to be blessed by it, to follow the righteousness of Christ, to accept your special day as a day of delight, this coming seventh day. In Jesus' precious name, amen.